Today I'm going to talk about the conservation of the Galloway Hoard. And first of all, I'll give a brief introduction for those who haven't been to the exhibition itself or have missed the previous two talks in the series. Um, the hoard was found by metal detectorists in 2014 and consists of Viking and Anglo-Saxon material that was all buried together in the ground around 900 AD. The hoard was found buried in two separate layers, as in this diagram. An upper layer consisting of Viking Age style bullion, which has silver ingots and arm rings, and an Anglo-Saxon pectoral cross. Then, below several inches of gravel, was a further collection of objects in three groups, as seen here. This lower group consisted of more Viking style bullion, about twice as much as in the upper layer. It also contained a group of four elaborate silver arm rings bound together with a fifth arm ring, plus a gold ingot, a ring and a bird pin lodged inside, possibly originally in a wooden container. The final object in the lower layer was a lidded silver gilt vessel, which was wrapped in linen and wool. The vessel itself, although only about 10 centimetres high, was packed full of a variety of different objects of many materials, including gold, decorated silver, stone, glass, rock crystal, and further textiles and leather, but also silk cloth and braids, the earliest recorded silk from Scotland. And this is a diagram showing the contents that were in that vessel. I started the conservation of the Galloway material in 2018, but this was four years after it had been found, so it's not the start of its life above ground. After excavation in the field, it came under the care of the treasure trove unit in Scotland and had to be assessed to verify its contents and for the committee to assign valuations for all the pieces. And for this to happen, it was necessary to ensure the condition of the objects were recorded and the objects themselves were stable. AOC, which is an archaeology unit based in Edinburgh, employs a conservation team and they were contracted to undertake this phase, which was mainly carried out by Gretel Evans and Natalie Mitchell at AOC. They photographed and x-rayed all the artefacts and unpacked the objects in the vessel. After evaluation, the objects were first displayed at NMS to raise money for the acquisition of the hoard, which was achieved with really generous support of the people of many individuals from Scotland, as well as funding bodies such as the Art Fund. So when I started the cons this conservation post, the majority of objects appeared a bit like this. They were mostly stable and free from loose overlying soil, but there was still plenty to do. And a brief look at some of the objects in more detail illustrates some of the issues. As you can see, some objects, such as this brooch, had a heavy layer of copper corrosion products on the surface of the silver, which looks green. This is because nearly all silver contains some other alloyed metals, usually copper. Even sterling silver is only about 92.5% pure silver. And because copper is a more reactive metal than silver, in certain burial conditions it will corrode preferentially, and the copper leaves a distinct green layer on the silver surface which often obscures the detail and the decoration. However, this green corrosion layer can also be very useful in preserving information. The back of this brooch shows patches of preserved leather. One of the most important aspects of the Galloway hoard is the preservation of organic materials, which often don't survive. But within the lidded vessel, conditions remained relatively stable over time and so helped their preservation. Many of the silver objects with green corrosion present were lying directly next to these leather or textile pieces. Textiles are incredibly delicate and susceptible to attack by microorganisms, such as bacteria and fungi. But as these organisms break down the textiles, they produce organic acids. And this acidic environment, in turn, will start to cause the copper within the silver to corrode onto the surface of the silver. However, as this happens, the copper is toxic to many of the microorganisms, so as it corrodes, it will considerably slow down the rate of decay and so help preserve the organic materials. This shows some weaving, quite heavily preserved by the effects of mineralisation on the textiles, but that retains the detail of the weave itself. And this is one of the textile bundles from within the vessel. Linen and cloth and silk braids are all present, 
partly preserved because of the presence of toxic mineral elements within the enclosed environment of the vessel. Before the objects were conserved, they were all also x-rayed, in this case mostly by AOC. This is a usual practice for archaeological materials. It helps determine the condition of the objects. Here you can see cracks and splits in these arm rings. It can also help identify when min different materials are used and can inform us about technologies. The x-ray of this bundle found inside the vessel shows some of these features. Different amounts of energy and time can be used on, by the x-rays to enhance different features. The x-ray on the left used a higher killer voltage and a longer time exposure. And here we see the outline of three gold socketed objects. Gold is very dense, but some of the detail of the construction of the sockets and the decoration on the hollow gold shapes is visible. The image on the right was taken with a much lower KV and for a shorter time period. The x-rays have not penetrated the gold at all, but what we're able to see is the textile wrapping the objects and many strands of silk braids within the bundle including one decorated with gold-covered thread in a crisscross design. In this x-ray, we get a glimpse of the detail under the corrosion before this brooch was conserved. It was one of a pair found in the vessel. We can also see other interesting features, clearly by examining both x-rays. Although superficially very similar, it is clear that the one on the left is much cruder in its design and manufacture. The inlay on the brooch on the right is carefully applied in the form of animals and interlaced decoration. The decoration on the left is difficult to determine, even after conservation. Um, with archaeological materials, it sometimes seems more like a forensic challenge when it comes to conserving the objects. We're trying to find out the maximum of information as possible about the objects and their life histories. We've got the levels of corrosion and decay in their present state, and these certainly contain important information, but clues as to whether the objects were old or new, worn or repaired, or accidentally or deliberately damaged, as well as the materials and technologies employed, all go towards helping Martin Goldberg, the curator, and his team interpret the hoard as a whole. Usually, the most controlled way of both conserving the objects and recording this information is to use hand tools and mechanically remove dirt and corrosion where possible. The cleaning process is done under a low-powered microscope using such things as scalpels, toothpicks, swabs, sharpened sticks and quills, needles, tweezers, solvents and mild abrasives. For some of the more sturdy, less corroded objects in the hoard, relatively little needed doing. Here a silver arm ring has had superficial dirt removed then an ultrasonic bath has helped get dirt out of corners and cracks and crevices. And finally, superficial corrosion and tarnish has been removed with swabs of calcium carbonate, acting as a mild abrasive. However, objects are often much more corroded, as can be seen on this selection of silver surfaces. So to illustrate a more involved mechanical cleaning, I'm going to use the pectoral cross, which came on the first layer, as an example. Although difficult to see before conservation, the cross is made from silver, but it's inlaid with gold and yellow. And yellow is a black silver or copper sulfide substance, which is placed into recesses cut into the silver to produce a color contrast in the design. The decoration on the cross depicts the four symbols of the, the evangelists. On the left, a winged ox of St. Luke. At the top, an eagle of St. John. On the right, a lion for St. Mark and at the bottom a haloed figure for St Matthew. The centre now only contains the remnants of a rivet, which originally must have held something in, else in place, possibly a jewel or a depiction of Christ. So here is a time-lapse video taken over several hours of cleaning part of the cross. We can see here how is using the various tools I described earlier. And here are some more detailed stills to show the difference between the object before and after it's cleaned. 
Here it's possible to see some of the gold decoration showing through on parts of the animal on the cleaned area. Here you can see its tail, its hind leg and one wing are depicted in gold. On an enhanced x-ray of the cross, gold areas show up as dense blobs which were inlaid into the silver. And as Martin Goldberg observed, the gold placed on the left and right arms were almost Im mirror images of each other, although denoting very different animals in an ox and a lion. These observations also give us more information about the decoration. It is the niello inlay which is used to form the features by inlaying into the gold. And here it's possible to see where the gold blob lies. It cuts through the ears and horns of the ox, but the features are still distinct. And an image of the hold of the ox when cleaned shows clearly where the gold has been used to highlight certain features of the animal. Here are some further images of the cross. This is St Matthew before and after cleaning, which you saw on the time-lapse video. And some details of his face and hands. You can see the end of his nose is gold, which is probably accidental, and the fingers in his hands are depicted using the yellow inlaid into the gold as well as the silver. This shows the eagle of St John reading the gospel before conservation. But this image shows some of the detailed work that the metal workers undertook. On the wing, you can see there are carved gold recesses for the niello and where a piece has fallen out. And if you look at the beak, there's a small nostril inlaid into the gold. Under magnification, you can see this is a carefully cut triangle. And the side only measures about a quarter of a millimetre long and looks like a dot from a distance. The final arm of the cross was St Mark, which was much more degraded than the other three. Under the dirt, it can be seen that the silver is badly corroded and has deformed the surface, and that some of the niello has come away from the silver channels that it was inlaid into. This detail shows the niello sitting proud. It's often less than a millimetre wide. Here the silver has changed into a light grey mineral on the surface, and some of the niello has reduced back to small curls of silver. Under this voluminous grey silver corrosion and the lifting niello was a darker layer directly onto the silver surface and caught within pits caused by the rest of the corrosion. Here are some before and after photos taken under the microscope to show you the corrosion in detail and also what I was seeing while I was working on the object. This shows how well some of the silver had survived compared to other areas where you can see it's pitted and damaged. And it also shows where pieces of niello are missing. Another thing it demonstrates is how inert gold is and how well this survives even after a thousand years in the ground, showing its original scratches. And this is the image of the lion after conservation, which is in a bit worse condition than the other parts of the cross. As well as the cross itself, there's also a fine silver wire spiral chain threaded through the appendant fitting at the top and wound round the body of the cross. It was made by attaching a number of pieces together and by twisting the end of one section of coiling into the next. The chain was another challenge to clean. The silver was covered in dirt, but also corroded to different extents along its length. When silver corrodes, it often becomes very brittle, so the thin wires had already broken in several places before the cross came to the museum. Again, hand tools were used for cleaning. A scalpel blade was too thick to get between the coils and would have scratched the surface. A fine brush was used to brush away loose or loosened dirt, and the ends of a porcupine quill were carved into a very fine wedge, which could be used to clean between the coils. With that, there was an application of a small amount of calcium carbonate to use to clean the corrosion where necessary, which could be rinsed off with a brush and with alcohol. This shows some close-up images of the chain after cleaning. 
The image on the right shows stress marks from age, use and corrosion on one of the coils. This can be seen even more clearly under a scanning electron microscope. The surface of the silver has many minute cracks where it has been coiled round and shows where it's vulnerable for, to break. As the chain was made from long coils of silver, it would have behaved a bit like an uncoiled spring when holding the weight of the cross. So a piece of string had been threaded through the centre to maintain its original length. Tiny fragments of this thread survived and could be seen at the end of breaks or where the coils had been stretched. The threads would have had to be very strong to take the weight of the silver cross and it seems they were made of animal gut. There are indications on these images that show original stretching and twisting of the gut, which are still visible on the fragments. This shows part of the conserved chain, and it also shows how fine the twists in the wire are. There's a scale at the bottom which measures two millimetres, and as you can see, it goes across roughly five segments of the chain. And this is the cross after conservation, which you can see in the galleries in Kukupri. Although mechanical cleaning is usually the preferred option, it's not always the best one. This slide shows a collection of silver ingots from the top layer of the hoard, and as you can see, a number of them are covered in green copper corrosion products. The main problem here is that the copper corrosion is much harder than the underlying silver, and some of the silver has a very rough and dimpled surface, so mechanically cleaning would be potentially damaging and very time-consuming. Therefore, the objects were soaked in a chemical solution, which would take the more reactive copper corrosion into solution without affecting the underlying less reactive silver. The results of the treatment can be seen here. The silver ingots were then rinsed repeatedly to remove any chemical residues. One reason for removing the corrosion was that some of these ingots were deliberately marked, which was not visible until they were cleaned. This is a slide showing the same group of ingots as before, some of which were chemically cleaned. On the third and fourth one, it's possible to see a fine cross scratched into the surface. For robust objects of pure silver, immersing them in a carefully chosen cleaning agent is fine, but when there are more complex objects, a local application is necessary. This slide shows some examples. The two brooches on the left are made from silver, inlaid with niello on four decorative beasts. However, these are also backed onto a thin gilded copper sheet. The copper sheet had corroded all the way through in some places, so immersing the whole object in the cleaning agent used for the ingots would cause a complete loss of part of the back of the brooches. However, some of the decorated pierced silver had accumulated copper corrosion on the surface, which we wanted to remove. Other objects, such as the composite bead pendant shown on the right, was partially wrapped in textile. This was extremely delicate and we needed to avoid it coming into contact with potentially damaging chemicals so it would remain intact for further study and analysis. So for objects such as these, we used a gelling or thickening agent such as agarose or gel or a CMC mixed with the cleaning agent. This allowed for specific local application. The gel would allow controlled access of the chemical cleaning agent to a limited area and draw in the reacted residues. The process was slow and needed many applications, but helped considerably to soften the corrosion, which could then be removed mechanically. And it was very effective for cleaning sm treating small areas, as can be seen for this brooch, which was conserved by my colleague Beth and Brian. That describes one chemical method for removing copper corrosion products from silver. But equally, if not more problematic, was removing ingrained silver corrosion products from the surface of silver objects. As can be seen, these arm rings are not green, but a mixture of gray and brown, and mostly consist of silver chlorides and sulfides. Once again, materials made from one metal are easier to treat, and the best method for removing silver chlorides and sulfides is by electrolytic reduction rather than by straightforward chemical cleaning. This is the setup used. 
In this central large Im image, it shows a tank containing an electrolyte, which in this case is sodium sesquicarbonate. The object is made into the cathode, and a piece of platinum-coated titanium mesh is made into the anode. The system is connected to a power supply via a potentiostat, which can control a three-electrode cell. This, in turn, enables a reference electrode to be used to ensure the correct voltage is maintained and to reduce the chlorides and sulfides back to silver. The objects are immersed for about three minutes before being taken out, brushed and rinsed. And the treatment is very effective and quick. However, it can't be used for all objects. For example, if they contain niello, niello would be turned back to silver. And also it can't be used for objects with copper corrosion on the surface, as the copper could be redeposited on the object as a thin copper plating. This was a potential issue when treating this large group of four arm rings joined together with a fifth one, which was treated by my colleague Charles Stable, who set up the system in our lab. And he is our electrolytic wizard, and if you want any more information about this treatment, I'd recommend talking to him. As can be seen, the four large arm rings have dirt and grey silver corrosion products on the surface, but the smaller arm ring has green copper corrosion products, probably from a more debased silver, which originally had more copper added to the alloy. The difference was even clearer when much of the surface and superficial corrosion had been removed. So to clean the large arm rings by electrolytic reduction, it was necessary for Charles to first remove the copper corrosion from the small ring by using localised cleaning. He then tested how the electrolytic reduction would work on a small area of the silver using an electrolytic pen. The pen is effective, but it usually is used for cleaning small areas of lightly tarnished silver rather than the incrustations of corrosion found on many archaeological, on many archaeological objects and would have taken a prohibitively long time to clean this set of arm rings. This image shows a close-up of the corrosion on the arm rings silver corrosion on the top and copper corrosion on the bottom. And this shows part of the arm ring following treatment, where the silver has been successfully cleaned without damaging the soft underlying metal, and it also retains the sharpness of the punch decoration. And this shows all of the arm rings conserved as they are now on display. As well as revealing information, it's also necessary to record and preserve information. This is an image of one of the ingots from the top layer of the hoard. On the underside at the bottom left of the slide is a small void. It's a casting floor which appears to be filled with charcoal from when the ingot was originally made. This detailed image shows the charcoal embedded and then removed from the silver ingot. Organic material directly associated with other objects is really useful, as unlike metal, it can be radiocarbon dated. So the charcoal was removed, brushed clean, and examined for identification under an optical microscope and a scanning electron microscope. It's important to know the species for radiocarbon dating, as long-lived trees can give dates which can be out by several hundred years. This species was probably elder, a relatively fast-growing tree, and was dated to AD. 680 to 870. It's also important to investigate technical issues which come up during recording and conservation. The x-ray of this pair of brooches, which are very similar, showed some technical differences. One of these was the application of the silver bosses and rivets holding the front and back metal plates together and attaching the catch plate on the back. It can be seen on the left-hand brooch, the bosses are held in place with a bent-over rivet, but on the right-hand side, a straight rivet has been embedded into a more opaque-looking substance, as seen on the X-ray. The right-hand brooch also had a repair to the catch plate, which is just to the right of the last boss. The catch plate had been broken, repaired, and then broken again in antiquity. And when this object was being cleaned, part of the old repair became loose and the overlying boss was temporarily detached. Here you can see the original break across the rivet hole, but under the corrosion was a repair in a different metal, which had again broken in the same place, leaving this brooch buried without a catch for the pin. Here is the loose boss, and we're able to examine the copper rivet 
pin embedded into the opaque filling in more detail. Elemental analysis of filling showed it was predominantly lead, now completely corroded, but although the rivet end had failed, the filling had held fast round its shaft. This was in contrast to another of the silver brooches in the vessel. On this brooch, two rivets had come away during burial and were found loose near the bottom of the vessel. On the X-ray, you can see that the rivet shafts have remained attached to the brooch, but the fill has failed, causing the bosses to become detached. Examination of the fill from these bosses showed, in contrast, that they were predominantly filled with tin and not lead, so different materials and technologies were being used for all of the three brooches I've just discussed here. Although not much restoration was required for the objects in this hoard, the brooch with the detached bosses pictured here illustrates how we did put detached pieces that had broken away, such as bosses, hooks and pins, back onto the conserved objects to show them in a more complete state in the exhibition. We did this with reversible adhesives where possible, so that we could get back to look at the information if we needed to. So that's been a quick overview of some of the conservation work that's been done, mainly on the metal objects in the hoard. And I have to say it's been an amazing project to work on, especially in collaboration with the curator, Dr. Mold Martin Goldberg, who's been an inspirational colleague, and it's been really exciting to reveal some of the unknown elements of this hoard for the first time, and it's now ready for future research and display. And finally, I'd like to thank many colleagues who've helped give advice and treat some of these objects, as well as acknowledge funding bodies such as the Art Fund and the National Museum, the Pilgrim's Trust, who all gave money towards purchasing the, the hoard, but especially the people of Scotland who gave very generously to allow this hoard to be purchased and for the conservation work to be completed. That was really incredible, Mary. Thank you so much for inviting us um, into the labs. It was a really interesting look. I think everyone enjoyed going over to Edinburgh for a, a, wee, uh, a wee adventure. <laughs> um, we've had a, a couple questions, but I just encourage everyone, um, if you've got any questions for Mary at all, please post them in the Q&A. Um, but yeah, we've got a couple to start us off, Mary. Um, so someone was asking, uh, about kind of the solutions that you were using throughout um, and they were wondering specifically about the cross and um, was there anything uh, any solutions that you used on the cross and um, to get it so clean <laughs> um, well the cleaning was mainly by the scalpel or the abrasive agents but to wet those I used um, IDA which is industrial denatured alcohol so rather than putting any sort of water, wetting the object, use alcohol instead, which is it's quite neutral and it's quite a good cleaning agent. Ah, okay. It's really fascinating seeing the cross, especially like seeing your pictures um, and the videos of it and then seeing it downstairs. I'm like, wow, it's so clean now. <laughs> like, it's incredible. Um, so we, we've got a few more. Um, some people asking about the Niello, which I've been pronouncing wrong for the past three months I think now <laughs> um, but yeah someone was asking do you reattach it when it comes off or do you just leave it um, as like two separate objects? Um, no it's reattached it's absolutely tiny it's only about a millimeter wide so it would get lost very easily so if the grooves are dirty or corroded where it's come up those are cleaned out and then I lay it back in place and then use a usually a syringe needle with a quite a dilute adhesive and it and just place it near the edge so it gets drawn in by capillary reaction and wait for the adhesive the solvent to evaporate and the adhesive to dry. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> These things are like so out of my realm that I'm just like, wow. <laughs> um, so how long does it take roughly to clean each object fully in the hoard? I guess it varies a lot from all the different sizes. It, it does vary a huge amount. Um, and some of them are in much worse condition. I mean, even the cross, the, the arm that you saw me clean there, I mean, the actual mechanical cleaning was about seven hours on that arm, but the one with the lion was probably double that because it was much more tricky. But um, it's difficult to say exactly because you're always recording things as you go along and 
making notes and taking photographs and so it, it's yeah but that's a rough time scale for those sorts of things under a microscope yeah yeah the um time lapses make it look like it's so fast <laughs> it only takes 30 seconds yeah <laughs> um some more um a, a little bit of a different question I suppose this time but how would the Vikings get such details into these pieces how would they get such details sorry into these pieces so into the the pieces in the hoard any ideas uh, I don't know amazing craftsmanship <laughs> yeah <laughs> very good eyesight <laughs> yeah I know that's the thing that we always keep saying about um like when they don't have glasses you're like my glasses are sitting there like <laughs> I need my glasses <laughs> Um, what else have we got? Oh, here's an interesting one um, about your career, I suppose. So how did you get into conservation work? Were you inspired from an artistic family? Um, maybe a bit, but I also was really interested in archaeology. The sort of two combined. I worked in a museum for a while and I just found myself being drawn to the artifacts a lot more. And yeah. I'm quite practical, so that was something that sort of seemed to bring the bring two elements together, three yeah. elements. Yeah, I guess you must have a lot, uh, a lot of patience as well. I think you have to have a particular type of nerdiness to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else have we got? Um, how much, uh, back to the Galway Horde, I suppose, so how much conservation work is there still left to do? Um, there's not very much, except the things that have been left and aren't in the exhibition are all um, involved with the, the textiles that are preserved. So the textile specialists who spoke last time, yeah. Susanna and Alex, um, they're working on recording this. So it's important they record all their information before the objects are stabilized because they need to get things like radiocarbon dates and proteomics and weave and fiber ID and consolidants that might help hold all these things together would obscure those details so we're sort of working in tandem to do that so at the moment my sort of my work is sort of um well it's kind of going along with how their work is progressing you see what i mean yeah. and it is mostly the textiles so as you saw in that video there's some there's a couple of nice little gold bits which aren't very difficult but yeah yeah so is there much to do from uh, the actual exhibition are you taking that back and doing some more work on it um, probably not very much conservation, it would be far more to do with this sort of material analysis and yeah. trying to find out more about the technologies and things that we haven't had a time to look at before it actually went on display. Yeah, <laughs> the big rush for us all to see it. <laughs> um, what else have we got? What's, oh this is an interesting one, what's the difference between cleaning and conservation? Well, they're part of the same thing, but there are lots of different sort of, I don't know, subtle definitions. Um, conservation is really trying to preserve as much as you can, which is very different from restoration, where you're actually putting things back, maybe even adding to them. But um, the cleaning in archaeological terms is, you can see it's actually removing the dirt and corrosion to get down to original layers, so you can see what was there, but also um, learning what's in those corrosion layers so you don't lose information so it's a it's a mixture of things but you would lose a lot of the or would never gain the information if you didn't clean off some of the dirt corrosion you wouldn't see yeah. other details so it's always a balance like archaeology itself you take the soil out and and that's gone forever but you've got the information yeah yeah um what else are we on um, is radiocarbon dating possible only on organic plant or animal materials? Yeah. Okay. It's, yes. It's the carbon sequestered by living organisms that's used to get the dates. So inorganic materials can't do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very simple answer to that. <laughs> um, does the decoration on the objects that you've conserved give any indication of the tools available to use at the time? Um, there are some little tool marks you can see. I don't think the tools would have been extraordinary. There were, you know, blades and little chisels and a 
abrasives probably to make surfaces so smooth. Um, yeah, I mean, apart from modern metals and machinery, it would have been done by hand, but it would have used sort of, they would have had metals and iron and steel and made their own tools. So. Yeah. Yeah, that is one of the things that I find fascinating about the arm rings in particular, seeing all the little dents and all the little scratches and stuff that you can see from like knowing that that was by someone's hand almost like knowing yeah. that those tiny wee marks come from someone else kind of thing with that they would have made a punch that would have been repeatedly punched along the silver so yeah. you get that repetitive design yeah because we're we're lucky enough to have some replica objects as well so those seeing the replica objects and the yeah the the repetition of it is really fascinating um yeah especially on the punches there we've got the little fish one that's our yeah. in our replica box <laughs> so that's the one um oh this is a really nice one um what surprised you most during the project <laughs> um that's a really difficult one <laughs> i suppose i just always get amazed i was looking down a microscope for so long i don't realize the scale that they're making these things at until you take them away and you can hardly see the little dot on that beak of the eagle. Um, yeah. So, and that, yes, you sort of get a sort of different view down a microscope and then realise when you see a scale next to it, how absolutely yeah, tiny, tiny it is. is. Yeah. Yeah. So was the cross your favourite object? That's my question. That's my own question. <laughs> I think it probably was. It's just yeah. an incredible set of designs for all yeah. the arms and, and the way it's all been yeah, the gold's been inlaid and the, and the yellow's been cut into that. And just, yeah, never seen anything like it, really. It's just yeah. such a beautiful piece. And the chain's yeah. incredible, too. So. Yeah, the chain is absolutely... It, it was one of the things when you see it on the video, even when... I mean, I see it all the time, but when you pointed out that those two millimetres are just five rings, yeah. that's... It's so small and you don't realise how small it is. I mean, even looking on the... Like in the video, I was like, wow, <laughs> it's so tiny. <laughs> and it's so perfect as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, is there a convention about whether you fix things or leave them? So the brooch with the lost rivets, you replaced them, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, things like that, which those replacements are very reversible if necessary. We know where everything came from. And on the whole, it's better to keep the whole object together. So in those circumstances, it would be better. Sometimes if there's, um, I mean, actually on that brooch, the pin is detached from the back because it was very, it was broken when it came in and it was quite loose. And just um, touring it around the country would only potentially damage it and it's not going to be seen. So yeah. that hasn't been restored back. That's just been kept separate. So it's not damaged. It's been photographed on it, but now it's off it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I suppose half the thing is making sure that you're not going to do any more, like make it any worse or, or age it. In yeah. A, but a way usually putting things back is actually for these yeah. objects, it's, um, it's keeping them safer and in place. And, you know, rather than having little bits just kept in different places and things. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You lose all the Tupperware boxes. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get another question up. Um, what do you do to prevent any further corrosion or silver tarnishing? Well, all the silver objects that are on display have been lacquered because silver is so susceptible to tarnishing from sulfides, which are so prevalent in the air just from pollution. Okay. And it's I mean, although we put scavengers in the cases to try and soak up the sulfides, if we didn't lacquer them, they would start to sort of go brown, grey and black again. And then it would have to be cleaned. And every time you clean off a corrosion layer, you're actually cleaning away part of the silver. So we don't want that to happen. So for displayed objects, they, they actually are all lacquered, the ones in Kukuba at the moment, right. to help preserve the silver yeah. colour. So would they tarnish a lot quicker because they're so much older? They might tarnish quicker because they've been cleaned. I know it okay. sounds that if you if a very sort of low rate of tarnish happens, that can sort of create its own stability in a way over a while. 
but as they've been cleaned and um, the corrosion was quite severe, it actually does leave them quite vulnerable to tarnish after the conservation. Yeah, it's really wonderful. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, what are we on now? Uh, does one technician do all the steps in the conservation or is it done by several technicians, each with their unique experience? Um, well, I work in a department with about six people. And although this was a project I was leading and came to do, um, as you can see from the, from the video, you know, some of my colleagues did bits as well, partly because it's just so amazing. It would be very mean not to let them. Yeah. <laughs> Also, you can't keep you know, it all for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Like Charles has, has um, sort of set up all the electrolytic reduction set up. So, you know, we do work together to exchange ideas and put in as much as we can between yeah. all of us. Yeah. So is there a lot of discussion before you start conserving an object? Do you have a, a like a team meeting to talk about the best way to do it? Um, not particularly for some things. I will just discuss the colleagues quite often there's um if i'm doing a chemical cleaning i will you know do a trial to see how it's going to work before i do more of the object and things like that and um so there's quite a lot of preparation before you start and mechanical cleaning in that way you've got the most control over you can see pretty quickly straight away if you're going you know how it's going to clean up and how it's going to work but with chemicals you definitely try it you know, on a little patch yeah. and see what's going on, see how yeah. it works. So do you test it on like a little bit of the actual object itself? Um, well, some of the gels which I hadn't used, I, I tested them on other objects. I mean, on sort of scrap bits of, of nothing to do with the hoard, just yeah. to see how they worked on the corrosion, because I just wanted to check that that would work. Um, but you can see on those arm rings, again, you can see the little patch that Charles tried out with the electrolytic yeah. pen before he put it into the actual, into the solution yeah. to make sure that was going to work okay. Yeah. Um, this, the animal gut always fascinates everyone. Um, so is it possible to identify the type of animal gut used in the pectoral cross chain? I Actually, I don't know. I mean, yeah. there is something called proteomics and I don't know if that can be used on animal gut. I'll, try and find out because it's certainly something <laughs> we'll be looking into yeah we could I mean it's very likely to be sheep or I mean that's usually what's used sheep or goat but yeah. yeah so is that quite a normal thing to have animal gut on the inside of chains like that well, it's not usual for well never seen a chain like that yeah <laughs> true fair <laughs> and then for the organics to survive is quite unusual but yeah. um if you think about the weight of the cross on that tiny, you need something really strong. An animal gut, gut you know, is an incredible strong material. They use it for musical instruments and things like that. Yeah. So it can take a lot of tension and it's very strong. So it sort of makes sense. Yeah, they, they would use something like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, is it possible to chemically or molecularly identify the sources of material of metals used in the artifacts such as where the copper gold silver or tin were mined um it's tricky but at the moment there is a big project being done on trying to identify the sources of viking silver which is being done by um dr jane kershaw at oxford university and she's been looking at lead isotopes which can give a, a signature to provenance of mines so there's always problems with when you've remelted the silver or when you've tried to purify it, you put more lead in. So it's quite a complicated process, but she's got um, a European research grant looking at exactly that. Okay. But obviously metals can be reused so many times and remelted together. So it's quite difficult to provenance. Them. Oh yeah, I suppose it, I hadn't thought about that. I knew they recycled metals a lot, but if you're taking it from two different places, I guess that kind of screws up everything of how you actually use it, how you figure out where it's from. Even. Yeah, so it is quite complicated, yeah. yeah. Wow. Someone had actually been asking me um, that question a couple of days ago, and I was literally like, I have no idea. <laughs> like, it's like, you should come to the talk with Mary. <laughs> um, 
so there's a, a few questions about the kind of field of work. Um, so do you specialize in conserving these types of items, just gold and silver? And if so, how did you realize this was what you wanted to specialize in? Um, well, I'm, I mean, conservation's changing and become much more general, but I really did specialize in archeological conservation. So objects that have been buried and have that particular sort of extreme degradation. And most of the objects in archaeological contexts are actually inorganics and metals often need more work. So I ended up doing a lot of archaeological metal work as because it's the archaeology that interested me in the yeah. conservation side of it. Yeah. So, so do, yeah, you do, do you do a lot of like field work or is it more just the metals kind of thing? I have done field work in the past. But yeah. Sometimes you go on, on site to lift objects as well. I mean, yeah. this group of objects would actually really have benef been benefit benefited from being lifted in the field and excavated in the lab. Yeah. So that you could actually get maximum information for the context. And that's, we try and encourage that, you know, if metal detectors do find something, it's it can be really important to lift them in a block so yeah. that they can then be investigated later. Yeah. Um, oh, someone's actually pursuing a career um, in your field um, and they don't have archaeological or scientific background. So how essential are scientific qualifications in order to enter the field? Um, I think they, I don't know is the answer. I mean, they were when I did it. I had, you had to have at least an A-level standard chemistry or have done a chemistry degree. But I, you know, some of the students that we've had in the lab lately have learned chemistry later on as they've been doing their, doing their degree. So there might be a way of sort of learning it as you go along, but it really does help to have that science, especially for the archeological material, because you're dealing with such a lot of sort of chemical and physical degradation. You kind of need to know what's going on with the materials. Yeah, yeah, I suppose there's so many different ways into different different fields um is it a sharpened porcupine quill it sorry is the sharpened porcupine quill a commonly used tool in conservation um probably not there just happened to be some in the cupboard I mean, <laughs> the, the staffordshire hoard i know they actually took um thorns to clean the gold oh, wow. so i think some of these organic materials are really good because they've got a sort of robustness and a sort of softness at the same time yeah, I mean, the quill was really useful because the end of it I could make into a really little flat wedge and it would have been much more difficult to have carved a thorn into that sort of thing. And it's yeah. also got quite a nice long handle. But I mean, I do carve wooden sticks and little bits of things all the time to make the sort of points that you want or the types of tools. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love the idea that you just had some porcupine quills in the cupboard. Like. <laughs> I know, it's a bit bizarre, but they're there. <laughs> um, how have conservation techniques advanced over the course of your career? Well, interestingly, quite a lot of what I was doing there are actually quite traditional techniques. Because as I said, I like to clean things mechanically if possible, because then you're not adding anything potentially corrosive or is going to change the stability of the object from another source coming in. So that's quite a conventional way of cleaning. And some of, I mean, um, yeah, some of the chemicals have been used for a long time and are quite tried and tested. I think there are sort of, I mean, the gels is something that has probably developed a lot more in my, during my career. Didn't, those weren't used nearly as much when I started, you know, trying to sort of do the local cleaning and to absorb things out and try different methods like that. And the, the um, pen for electrolytic reduction, that is, that's quite a new development. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing like a, a good old porcupine quill. <laughs> um, how are the objects initially tested to determine what the object is made out of? Um, well, it depends where you are and what facilities you've got. I mean, these objects were, when they were in the care of AOC and Historic Environment Scotland, they were tested with an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, which could give you an idea of the metal. But actually, you wouldn't have needed that 
if you're experienced enough, you can, you can tell pretty much what they are. The things that might be difficult to tell would be, is it a, what sort of copper alloy is it? If it's just looking green, is it a brass or a bronze or a leaded bronze? And that sort of thing you would want an XRF for. But otherwise, from the way that corrodes and from the, the style, you know, lots of things indicate to somebody who's used to dealing with the objects what the metal is. And gold just stands out as gold anyway. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah was that something that was, because I know that's very unique. So was it something that you'd worked with much from like that age, the, the gold objects? Uh -huh. A bit. I mean, gold throughout the ages, it's just because it's so chemically inert. I mean, occasionally, if it's got a lot of copper in the alloy, you can get copper corroding on the surface. But you dig it out of the ground and it, it's shining like that. It's yeah. just it's just one of those. Yeah. Yeah, you I know exactly that, what it is. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's always been so precious, I guess, because it doesn't yeah. return back to sort of stone. Yeah. Yeah. Um. How do you avoid damaging or scratching objects during cleaning with abrasive tools such as scalpels? By being very, very careful. <laughs> Doing it under microscope, yeah. very slowly. Yeah, you must yeah. have very steady hands. <laughs> well, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> a lot of practice, I suppose. Yeah. But you get used to how much give the corrosion and the soil will, will do, and you know at some points you you're not going to be able to go any further without damaging the underlying metals. So you have to use a chemical or you have to sort of ping it off with something else. Yeah. It's it's partly just sort of being careful and partly having some a lot of practice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we're in our, our last couple of questions now. Um, but were you surprised at the amount of detail the cleaning revealed? Um, not really in some ways I mean I'm always amazed at the detail of the sort of workmanship but I've cleaned the sort of enough early medieval stuff to know that it is amazingly intricate and beautifully done so I wasn't surprised it was just a kind of it's a pleasure to do it though yeah it's so amazing um oh this is a nice question um which object gave you the most joy to reveal and why well, it was a cross, really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, by the time I got the cross, it was very difficult to see because it was four years after it had been excavated to actually see under the dirt what all the decoration was, what, even what the animals were. And, you know, and cleaning those off and finding the cow with its big sad panda eyes and things like that. Very, <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, really enjoyable thing to do. Yeah, yeah. The cross. I think the cross is one of those ones as well. When you see it in the exhibition, it's obviously amazing. But it is seeing your videos and seeing the excavation, the uh, conservation of it, that really brings it to life. You can see how it began and how it's kind of ended up because it is gleaming in that case. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean we're lucky. It is an amazing condition. Most of it, apart from the lion, it's a bit sad. Yeah. But you know we're really lucky. That it was preserved that well underneath the corrosion yeah yeah well i think that's a, a really excellent place to end tonight unless anyone has some very last questions um to send in uh but yeah i think the cross is always a nice a nice place to end and it's nice to hear that you as you say had so much joy um unveiling it and seeing everything uh, that it had to offer um, so yeah, thank you so much, Mary, for joining us this evening and for giving us a little tour, a little behind the scenes tour um, of the labs. Um, also, a, a big thank you to the wider team at the National Museums of Scotland for working with us. Uh, this event's programme has been sponsored by Art Fund, Garfield Weston Foundation and Museums Gallery Scotland. We thank them for their continued support, which is allowing us to put on these events. Um, our next lecture is on the 27th of April, and it's all about the Anglo-Saxon inscriptions of the Galloway Horde, and we're excited to be joined by Dr. David Parsons. Uh, tickets for the event are available on our Eventbrite page, and some fun news about Kukubri Galleries in general. With Easter coming up, we have a wide range of family-friendly activities 
from children's lino cutting workshops to silver clay jewellery making. Um, and most excitingly, on the fourth, on the 9th of April, sorry, we are hosting the Discovery Fair uh, just across the road from the galleries on the Sopery Gardens. There's going to be free kids activities, a Viking storyteller, a visit from the treasure trove among local crafters selling their Viking inspired wares. Um, and you can find more details of that on our website. That's on the 9th of April. Um, Another thank you, of course, to the behind the scenes crew here at Kirkibri Galleries and Dumfriesen Gallery Council, and of course to you all for joining us this evening. The support for this exhibition has been really wonderful, and we look forward to welcoming you to the next event or to the exhibition when you come and visit.